God is just now, we've just know Moses is just getting the Ten Commandments, and now God is moving on. It's a tremendous couple of chapters where God just deals with daily living. But before we get into the message this morning, God brings off two quick points, and I want to be brief because uh, God just touches on them, but I want you to understand two quick lessons. I want you to notice in verse number 20, God gives a lesson. And Moses said unto the people, fear, this is chapter 20, verse number 20, just before what we read, finished with the Ten Commandments. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces. Now that's an interesting statement. He says, fear not, but fear and Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. If you just want to grab down a little nugget, the fear of God keeps us from sin. The fear of God keeps us from sin. He said we don't have to be afraid of God. He's going to hurt us because he's mean, because he's angry. But the fear of a reverential God, a holy God, a perfect God, a loving God, having that fear will keep us from sin. And that's what he said. He came to prove him, and that fear will keep you from sin. Proverbs 3, 7, I think it's in your notes. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 16, 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity are purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So let's, problem with America, and problem with most Christians, we've lost our fear of God. But he throws that out, he has the Ten Commandments, he said, but don't forget, what's going to keep you from evil is your fear of me. And then in verse 23 of chapter 20, he's got an inter interesting thing, we know in the commandments he said, no other gods before me, and thou shalt have no graven images, but in verse 23 he says, ye shall not, this is after the Ten Commandments, Make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. I believe when I look at that, God says, not only should you not have graven images about anybody else, but don't make any graven images about me. Don't have any statues about me. Don't have any tools for religion about me. He said, I don't want you to worship them at all. And you say, preacher, why would that be? I believe because, and I think we're preaching on this tonight, in John 4, 23, Jesus said, but the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So we, the whole idea is God says, I don't want you to be focused on a symbol. I don't want you to be focused on just a, a statue. I don't want you to be focused on any religious trinket. I want you to focus on me. So we're in the spirit and in our heart. So those are quick two little nuggets. We're not leaving yet, so I just will let you put those down and take with you. But this morning, we're going to look at this passage there in chapter 21. Truly, I believe, can be one of the greatest illustrations, encouragements, and challenges to your Christian life. It will make a complete difference in your life if you can let God bring it to your mind and bring it to your heart and make those decisions. And too many Christians miss it. They miss the importance. Again, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what's right, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when we read little passages like that, we have to say, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to open my eyes to? What is it that I can apply? And this application for that little passage there in the first part of chapter 21 will change your life. As I was meditating on it and studying it, boy, I was just so encouraged and so challenged. So let God speak to you. It's not a deep message. It's not a hard message. But if we'll apply it and make it part of our heart, it will definitely change our life. Here's the story. In chapter 21 and for the next few chapters, God's dealing with routine life. In other words, if you buy something or if you loan it to somebody and they break it, what are they supposed to do if you've got an animal that does something to somebody? All the things, just fairness. But he starts out with this little passage, and look at what it says in verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, in other words, somebody who indentures themselves, somebody who because of debt, tradition at the time was, you went in debt, you could go work it off, or you could hire yourself out. Uh, for that. And so they understood what that was. He said, so if you buy yourself a Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and the seventh year he shall go out for nothing. In other words, he says, you can only, of the Jews, of your people, he said, you can only hire somebody, you can only buy somebody, you can only do that for up to seven years. At the seventh year, they go home. Is it. You can't do it more. You can't hold them for life. You can't force them to go. He said, you only make an agreement, make a contract with them for those six years. On the seventh year, you go. And then he lays out some particulars. If he came in by himself, he should go out by himself. 
In other words, he just came in by himself. He didn't have any family. He's just a young man or an older man. He signed up. He's going to go out. If he were married, then his wife should go out with him. So if he's married and he comes to the, to the master of the ranch or farm or whatever it is, and he's got his wife and children with him, when he goes out, they go with him. But then he says, If his master have given him a wife, and she hath borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. In other words, he's, he's there, and the master has given him one of his other servants or somebody in his household, family. Now that's his wife. He says, you can go by yourself. But for chapter, verse number 5, we begin to see the decisions we all have to make. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master. I've been serving with him. I've been serving him now for six years. He's been good to me. It's been a blessing. I've learned. I've grown. I've been protected. It's, it's a, such a blessing. I love my master, my wife. He said, why would I want to leave my wife and my children? I will not go out free. He said, I don't want to leave. I'm not going to go. Verse 6, if that be the case, then his master shall bring him under the judges. In other words, they bring him down to a public meeting. And he shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And the master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. So as we look at that passage, and we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration as far as instruction, as we begin looking and say, God, what are you trying to show us? I believe what we have here is a decision every Christian needs to make. Every person of us needs to decide, what am I going to do with my master? Am I going to leave my master or am I going to stay? Am I going to serve or if I'm going to go on? Am I willing to make that kind of choice? And so we look at the passage, a little different kind of message this morning, but I tell you what, as God has given us this wonderful picture, this wonderful instruction, you and I need to bear it in our mind in our heart, I can guarantee you in my life, years ago that made an impression on me and I followed through with it and by God's grace and God's help I'm going to finish strong because of this principle we see here this morning. So let God speak to us as we work our way through it and let God challenge your heart. First of all, we find the choice to be made. The choice to be made. So here he is. By the way, we all like choices. Don't we like choices? That's why, was it, Baskin-Robbins got how many flavors of ice cream? Got a bunch. You go to McDonald's, the health food capital of the world, and you walk up and say, I'd like a hamburger. They say, what kind? How many are willing to admit they remember when, when Burger King, uh, uh, McDonald's only sold hamburgers? A big what? A double what? Just hamburgers. These young folks are just ham- yeah, just hamburgers. If you went up there back up in those days and say, I want a Big Mac, they even have no idea what you're talking about. I like a double cheeseburger, they have no idea what you it's just hamburgers. But we like choices. So as Christians, we say, Well, I like choices in my coffee, I like choices in my drink, I like choices in my eats, I like choices in all this, I like choices where I go. But here's a choice that we may not like, but a choice we must make. Here's the choice. First of all, we find it's a personal choice. Here he is, the servant has been serving his master for six years. He now has a wife and he has children. And his master says, all right, the time is up, year's up. You are free to go. You are free to leave. You're free to go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. I have no more control over you. You're at liberty to do what you want. Do you understand he has a choice to make at that point? He has a personal choice. He either has to say, thank you, master. I'm gone. Wife, kids, I'm gone. Or he says, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. I think as a child of God, sometimes we get to that place, we need to make that choice. Will you go? By the way, it's a personal choice, and we are free in our will to go. We are free agents before God. We have soul liberty. We can go. Jesus will not make you stay. Jesus will not make you serve. Jesus will not make you follow him. He just knows what it is. He's the good master, but we have that choice. Will we go? We are free to go. Will we go? So this choice is personal. It's also voluntary. Voluntary. That decision in my life, as I think of my master Jesus Christ, as the picture here in this, in this little story or in this instruction he gives, as Jesus Christ is my master, I have to make the decision for myself. It's personal. I have to make it for me. 
By the way, not only do I have to make it for me, I must make it. I must decide if I'm going to follow. I must decide if I'm going to commit. I must decide if I'm going to go ahead and stay with the master. It's something that you must decide as well. The master in this passage could not make that decision. He could not tell his servant, you've got to stay. No, you're free. He could not tell his servant, you must stay another seven years. You must stay your lifetime. No, it was a free choice for this man to make that decision. The master could not and will not make it for us. Jesus will not make the decision for you to stay with him or not. He will not force you to stay with him or not. We are just like that servant. We have the free liberty to come or go. So it's a personal choice. I'm asking you this morning to say, have you ever made that choice? Have you ever made that commitment we see here by this man to say, no, I'm going to stay with my master. So it was a personal choice. Number two, it was a particular choice. It was a particular choice. You say, what choice was it? He chose the master. He chose the master. Who did he choose, class? He chose the master over himself. He said, I have liberty to go. I have freedom to go. I have served my time, and now I can go wherever I want, do whatever I want, live like whatever I want. He says, but there's a problem here. He says, I want the master. I choose the master. One of the greatest things in your Christian life and in my Christian life is when we get to the place we say, I know what the world offers. I know what my flesh wants to do. But with God's grace and God's help, what I want is I want to choose the master. Boy, when a child of God gets to that place where he says, no, it's the master is everything. I choose to be with him. What a blessing. What a change in our life. And that's what his choice was. It was particular. In fact, in Colossians 3, 23, whatsoever you do, we, we read this and say it very often, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance. Listen, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We choose the master. We're choosing the Lord Christ. Today you have liberty. Never come back to church. You have liberty not to tithe ever again. You have liberty to, not, to never read your Bible. That's a mistake. That's wrong. You'll pay for it. But, but you have that liberty to do it. The challenge today is make a choice. Let's choose the master. Let's choose him. Again, ye serve Christ. He chose the master. Ye serve Christ. Let me help you with something. That, that key of choosing the master and serving the Lord Christ, if you understand that, you're not serving the church. Oh, you may help the church, you may work in the church, but while you're working in the church, you're serving the Lord. Who class? Christ. Look at there, Colossians 3, 24. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Who are we serving? The Lord Christ. Who are we serving? The Lord Christ. We're making that choice. He said, whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. He said, because we serve the Lord Christ. So as you clean the building, clean it to your best of your energy and best of your ability. Why? Because I'm serving the Lord Christ. When you're singing in the choir, you want to sing your very best. Why? Because you're serving the Lord Christ. Yes, you're singing for the people. Yes, you're trying to help people. Yes, you're trying to make the service right. But the key is you're serving the Lord Christ. What a difference that makes when you say, I'm not serving the church, even while I'm serving the church. I am serving actually the Lord Christ. So you're not serving the, the church. You're serving the Lord Christ. You're not serving the pastor, but you're serving who class? The Lord Christ. Oh my goodness. You pastor, sometimes you goof up. Yes, I do. Well, I'm going to be mad and I'm out of here. Well, why? Because you're not serving the pastor. We're serving the Lord Christ. It's even while we're serving others. We're not serving others. We need to be serving the Lord Christ. There in Matthew 25, 37. They ask, When saw we saw thee as a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we it sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. All service, all ministry, all care calling, all following up on people, encourage me. Yes, because we love people. Yes, because they're brothers and sisters in Christ. All those are good reasons. But the most glorious reason, the most permanent reason is the choice we make because I'm serving, who class? The Lord Christ. Oh, I tell you what, but I'm weary, but I'm serving the Lord Christ. They didn't appreciate it, but I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for the Lord Christ. And so he made a particular choice. He chose the master. He could have chosen other people, but he did not. Oh, what a, by the way, what a master we have. As a Christian, what a master 
we have. See, we read that passage and all we think about is the terrible stories about slavery in the South in those years and whatnot. But I've got news for you. We have a wonderful master. A master that loves us more than our parents love us. A master that loves us more than our spouse loves us. His love for us. What a master that we're choosing. He loves us. He cares for us. Cares beyond him. No matter what we do, no matter how we live. Yes, he may discipline us. Yes, he may be concerned about where we go. But his love for us never, ever, ever wanes. There's nothing you can do to, keep, to make God love you less. Not a single thing. He may not be able to manifest it. I teach this so often because people don't understand it. He loves you just the same. It's just like a parent who has a, a four-year-old or a five-year-old. I know your four and five-year-olds are all perfect. But you love that child and when they're doing good, you hug them, you buy them ice cream, you get them presents, you do wonderful things. But say that five-year-old or six-year-old or teenager or whoever it is starts misbehaving, start doing unkind things and start doing sinful things and wrong things, you still love that child. Hello. You love them just as much as you did before. You can't manifest that love in the same way. Oh, look, you broke the window. You threw a rock at your sister and broke her teeth out. Oh, come here and give me a hug. No, you don't do that. You still love them, but you can't manifest it because you have to deal with it. But we serve a master who loves us all the time. He may not be able to manifest it because of our cares, but he, our life, because, but he does. He's a wonderful master. He loves us. He cares for us. He's the best shepherd. He knows what's best for us. He corrects us. He feeds us. He guides us. Wow. Let's choose the master. That's what he said. Master said, it's, it's up. You can go. But he made a choice. He said, I want the master. Yeah. Before we think too highly of ourselves for choosing to serve the master. Let me read a verse for you. Well, I'm so wonderful. I'm, I just, I'm just such a wonderful person. I'm just going to go ahead and choose the master. I'm going to serve the master. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who? Christ Jesus being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Before we think about that, think about our master and his choice to serve us. His choice to humble himself and become a servant. Did you know Christ and I have to say this carefully. He serves us. The master serves us. He thought of himself of no reputation, but humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So how does he serve us? He serves us, and he did serve us, on Calvary. This old rotten sinner, just like you, as an old sinner, headed for hell. Couldn't do anything about it. Already sinned. Already the wages of sin is death. Christ, though, loved me so much as my, even though my master, he came and humbled himself, took on himself the form of a servant, made likeness of man, fashion of man. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. He came to seek and to save. But when you think of Calvary, remember, it's the master serving me. He went to the cross, not for himself. But for me, he suffered all the pangs of hell. Not for himself, of course not. But for me, let's choose the master who would serve me. He served us on Calvary. He serves us even in our daily life. In John 13, 4, you know the story. There he is with his disciples. And he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After they had poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. The master then took that towel, girded himself, and began to wash the disciples' feet. And he says, you, I've given you then an example. Oh, he serves us also in heaven right now, interceding for us. Wherefore he, talking about Christ, is able to save them to the uttermost. I love that expression. Save to the uttermost. We have that song. Save to the uttermost. Or as one old preacher said, save from the guttermost. 
Oh, I tell you what, we were in the gutter all the way down, but he saved us at a rotten soul. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever leaveth, liveth, Christ rose from the dead, he liveth, to make intercession for them. He's serving me now, interceding to the Father on my behalf as his child. What a wonderful master we have. If God, the Lord Jesus, the master of the universe, can re humble himself to serve us, we ought to choose the master to serve him also. Amen. Also, the Bible tells me, and I can't understand this completely, he will serve us in the future. Remember when he was with his disciples, it says he, he poured water in a basin and washed their feet and served them. The Bible says in Luke 12, verse 36, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, talking about Jesus coming back. And when he cometh and knocketh, that ye may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. I don't understand that. But as Jesus was giving that parable, he says, when the, when the king comes back talking about himself, he said, I'll have them sit down and he'll serve them. We have a song. We talk about that. He'll go down and serve us. He will serve us. I can't imagine a love like that. I can't imagine a, a humility like that to be willing to do that. Free will. Time is up. He's free to go to make the choice. It's a personal choice. I can't make the choice for you to stay and serve Christ. Your parents can't make the choice for you to stay and serve Christ. Your children can't make the choice for you to stay and serve Christ. You have to make it yourself. So it's a personal choice. It's a particular choice. I'm choosing the Lord Jesus. Wow, what a choice. But also very quickly, it's a permanent choice. It's a permanent choice. It was for a lifetime. It was for how long, class? A lifetime. You look back in the text, in verse number 6, and the last part of the verse, and he shall serve him forever. Boy, when he got that place, he said, no, I'm going to stay. And he took that all and he put that hole in his ear, drove it through to the door. And he said, I'm going to serve him forever, forever, For It was a permanent choice. Here's what we want as Christians. We want to put our, put our ear out and say, here's a magic marker, make a mark. It'll wear off. I can wash it off later if I want to. But no, with that hole in the ear, it was permanent. He's saying, I'm, there's no going back. There's no change in my mind. There's no going back. There's no tearing up the contract. He said, it is permanent. It's for a lifetime. In fact, in Deuteronomy 15, 17, where he talks about this, it says, then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it through his ear unto the door, and he shall be thy servant forever. In other words, he didn't just make a dent, it went all the way through. In other words, that was a commitment for a lifetime. When that servant says, no, I choose the master. I'm free to go, but I'm making a choice personally, and I'm choosing my master, and him I'm going to serve, and him I'm going to serve forever, and I'm making it permanent. Go ahead and put that hole in my ear, because we know it is permanent. Boy, ladies and gentlemen, until you and I make that permanent choice, we're on the danger of falling away. Until you and I make that choice, every wind of doctrine is going to knock us around, every little trial is going to come, every little persecution is going to come, but ladies and gentlemen, when we've said, no, I've made a permanent choice and I've chosen the master and I've chosen to serve him go ahead and make it permanent boy then we are set for a lifetime Romans 12 1 gives the same illustration only in a deeper way it says I beseech you therefore brethren he says I beg you by the mercies of God you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why make yourself a living sacrifice? Why give yourself wholly unto him? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Say, preacher, I want to know the will of God for my life. Here's where it starts, right there. Give yourself to him. He said, until you, he said, give yourself a living sacrifice unto God. In other words, I'm giving up my rights. I'm giving up my persuasion. I'm giving up my preferences. I'm a living sacrifice for God. God says, now when you're there, now you're able and ready to receive the perfect will 
of God, the acceptable will of God, the good will of God. Here's our problem. We say, God, show me your will, and I'll decide if I'm going to do it. God says, it doesn't work that way. You make yourself a living sacrifice, and you'll be able to prove, you'll find, you'll test the perfect will of God. You say, preacher, I want clarity. I want revelation for the will of God. That's where it starts, right there. Giving up your rights and making yourself a living sacrifice. Now, for most Christians in the world today, and for those folks that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, this sounds fanatical. Problem is, it's Bible. Well, I don't want to submit to God. Why? He's the great master who loves me, died for me, wants to care for me, knows everything about me and loves me in spite of that and wants to use me and is going to take me home to heaven forever. Why shouldn't I want to serve him? But it's a choice. It's a permanent choice, giving away our rights. Matthew 10, 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Listen, but he that findeth his life, in other words, you hold on to your life, you take your life, shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. In that story, in that requirement where that servant says, no, I choose the master. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to go. I love my master. And so I'm going to stay here. Go ahead and mark me. I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. Every day of my life, I'm going to serve you. Go ahead and mark there. He said, when he then has lost his life, in other words, he gave it up for the master, he found it. Christian, when we give up our life for him, we find real life. No, I'm going to keep my life. I'm going to make my own choices. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. The choice. Number two, the commitment. The commitment. Again, we're free not to, you're free not to accept this. You're free to go. But my desire for you is to make the choice to serve the master. Very quickly, notice the commitment. By the way, the commitment was twofold. To stay and to serve. To stay and to serve. Verse number five. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. So he said, I'm going to stay. I'm sticking around. You're not going to get rid of me that easy. I'm going to stay, not go out. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he'll bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Yeah, so when he said, I'm going to stay, he knew the deal. How many understand he knew the deal? It wasn't they put an old in his ear and said, now you've got to serve me forever. What? I didn't know that. No, he knew that. He was saying two things. I'm going to stay. I will not go out. I will not leave. I'm, you're stuck with me. And not only that, but I'm not going to hang around and just whittle on the front porch. How many know what whittling is? Uh, the old folks know what whittling is. I mean, you just get a stick and a pocket knife and you just cut it away to nothing. You pick up another one and just cut it away. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's called whittling, just whittling away. But he didn't say, I'm going to stay, and I'm going to stay on the front porch and whittle, and hopefully you'll give me some food to eat. No, he said, I'm staying, and I'm serving. He said, I've been doing it already for six years. I know what it's about. I've been doing it now for six years, and I know how you have served, how to serve. He said, but I'm going to stay and to serve. So the commitment was to stay and to serve. Very quickly, hear the message of the commitment. The message of the commitment. You say, preacher, I'm not sure where you're going. I don't know if it's blessing you, but it blessed my heart when I was look at this wonderful picture, and I make the choice and make the commitment. The message of the commitment. First of all, it was very plain. It was very plain. Verse number five. And if the servant shall plainly say, no trickery, no, I got you. No, I alluded to the fact, no, plainly say. Child of God, we don't have to be wishy-washy about it. In my life, I can go back to the days that I came to that old-fashioned altar and I'd been saved for a while, but I said, no, God, the best I can, I'm giving myself to you. I was volunteering. I would say, I'm staying. You're stuck with me, and I want to serve you. And you make it plain. Until you make it plain, you'll not be stuck. Until you make it plain, you'll be in and out and wishy-washy. You just need to make it plain with the Lord. Say, I am yours. I will follow. Hear the message of the commitment. It was plain. Again, that's 
as they drilled through the hole, it was all the way to the door. There was no question about it. It was all the way to the door. Verse number five, and the servant shall plainly say, that word plainly say means to say, to declare, to boast thyself. In other words, he said, hey, I am staying and I'm serving. I'm not leaving, I'm not an abandoned, I'm staying and I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. He didn't say, well, I think I might stay for a little while and as long as things are going smooth, I might serve. As long as I don't have too much to do. I, no, he made it clean. Well, I tell you what, when you and your life come to the master and say, I'm not leaving you, I'm serving you and I'm choosing you, the master, to serve and make it clear. Oh, what a difference it'll make. So we find the commitment, we hear the message we hear the message of commitment. It was plain and it was public. It was what class? Public, public. Verse number five. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out. Then the master shall bring him unto the judges. Boy, he said, all right, let's go downtown. Let's go to the courthouse. Let's get the witnesses that we need. He shall also bring him to the door, to the doorpost. Boy, he made it public. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of the master you've chosen. That's, he said, we're going to go make this public to the world. Jesus said in Mark 8, 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Boy, I just made the message just clear. It was plain and it was public. Don't be ashamed to say, I'm a child of God. Don't be ashamed to say, I can't do that. I've got another master. I can't follow your way because I've got another master. I can't make that decision because I've got another master who's made a decision for me. But here's the key. And this is why many of us struggle with this decision. Because we don't have the motive. I'll serve God because I think I will get something out of Him. I'll serve God because it makes me feel good. I'll serve God because that will make my wife happy and she'll get off my back. I serve God because that will make my parents happy. I say, no, you miss the motive. You miss the motive. We see the motive for commitment and it is love. Are you listening? Love. Notice what it says in verse number five. And if the servant, he's free to go. He's free to go. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master. So preacher, how can I keep serving God year after year through the trials, through the heartaches? How, how can I do that, you might ask yourself. If you love him. If you love him. You love your spouse. And from day one you found out they weren't perfect. You thought they were perfect until you said, I do. And they said, oh, no, you don't. Or you got up the next morning and found out they have bad breath too. And you move into the house and all of a sudden, what's these socks in the floor for? Did we have a robber come in and steal? No. And toothpaste drippings all over the sink? And what's this hair doing in the sink? And don't you know what that little lever does? And 50 years later, you're still saying, I know where that hair in the sink came from. <laughs> I know why those socks are still there. But I'm still here because I love them. We sing about it. Oh, how I love Jesus. And if the servants shall plainly say, I love my master. In Romans 8, 35, to the end of the chapter, there's two types of love. There's the love we have for Christ and the love that Christ has for us. The first part says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, what's going to stop me from loving Christ? And the next part, it talks about his love for me. But it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? The answer is no. 
Tribulation is not going to keep me from loving the Lord. Shall distress keep me from loving the Lord? No way. Or persecution, though I be persecuted, though they chop off my head, though they torture me? No, it's not going to happen. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or peril? No. Or sword? No, it's not. As it is written, for thy sake, his sake, we are killed all the day long. We are as counted as sheep for the slaughter. Oh, he says, nothing's going to separate me from loving God. I might as well count myself dead, but I'm going to love him. That's the kind of love that keeps us going. That's the kind of love this fellow said. I love love my master. Go ahead and put the hole in my ear. I love my master. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stick. I'm going to stay and I'm going to serve and I'm going to love it because I love my master. When you and I fall in love with Jesus Christ and realize how much he loved us and he's the perfect one and how much he cares for us and how he wants to dwell in us and lead us and guide us and we say by choice and by affection because he loved me first as the Bible says I love him. Until we get that motive down our commitment will be very very soft. 1 John 5, 2. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Not only do I obey the commandments, but I'm not mad because I have to. Not only do I obey the commands of God, but I do it because I love Him. Not only do I obey the commands of God, but it's, it's only a reasonable thing to do. He loves the master. Love for the master. But that's not all. The motive. How can I keep serving him? How can I keep, give, how, how can I be willing to give him the rest of my life? Verse 5. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children. In other words, it's the love for the family also. The love for the family. And that family would be the family he got after he came to the master. Because if he, if he went to the master with the family, they go out with him. But he says, no, I love the family I found since I got in with the master. Wow. We sang the song, Family of God. He said, I love my master and my family. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not quitting. I'm not going back. Ah, oh, but I know some of those people, I know those people in the church. Yeah, so do. And they know you too. In your family, every family probably has some Uncle Irvings. Nobody really likes Uncle Irving coming over. He's obnoxious, he's a know-it-all, he falls asleep, he drops things, he makes a mess, oh my. But we love him because he's family. Don't you mess with him. He said, I, I love my master and my wife and kids. The family of God. And it's also for the fruit. They were born unto him. His own children came in him while he was with the master. See, I didn't have the family of God until I got saved. I had my earthly family. I had an earthly wife. But then I met the master and served him. Found a new family that I have to be honest. Over these years have been more dear to me than my physical family. We find the motive, the commitment. It was a commitment. He said, I'm staying. For, you said, I'm staying and I'm serving. Here's the problem. We Christians, we want to stay, but we don't want to serve. Or we want to serve, but we're saying, I'm not going to stay if things get bad. He said, no, I'm staying and I'm serving. And the motive is love. Very quickly, notice it will be done. The mark of commitment. The mark of commitment. Verse 5, and so if the servant shall plainly say, free choice, would you say, I love my master? If the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will no not go out free. He said, I know, but I'm not going to go. Well, Christians, so many Christians aren't here even today because they've chosen, I want freedom out there. I want to be free to live my own life, to live the way I want to. Here's the system. No, I'm choosing to stay. 
Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. So he's got the witnesses, he's got the crowd, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. That little hole in his ear. First of all, the people watch and say, I know what that's about. I know what he's committing to. He's committing to staying. He's committing to his master. He's committing to that family. He's committing to serve. Everybody could see it. They could see the mark of commitment. Down the road, they could see that mark of commitment. They say, oh, look. He belongs to somebody else. He made a choice to follow somebody else. He made a choice to give himself to his master. He made a choice to love his master. He made a choice to serve his master all the days of his life. How do you know? I can see it. I'm not suggesting you get holes in your ears. But can anybody see? Parents, can your kids see? There's a mark on their life. In fact, the Apostle Paul says he bare in his body the marks of the cross. He said, it's obvious. I made a decision. It's obvious. I serve. So others could see it, but I think also he could always remember. He'd look in the mirror and say, where's that thing? Scab's gone. 20 years later, it's still there. We need to have that mark. Again, I'm not talking about marring your body, but I'm talking about that same spiritual mark. So the day comes when you think you're going to quit. Wait a minute. I made a commitment. Can't quit. Well, I'm bailing out of this. I'm bailing out from the Lord. Wait a minute. Can't do it. <laughs> I made a commitment. Because I love him. Because I love the family. And I want to keep serving him. Oh, right now I'm a little miffed, but I got that mark. In your spiritual life, if you're going to make it for the rest of your life with serving him, boy, you need to have that mark. Again, not physically. Saying, no, I'm not my own. So when, when somebody would come to that servant and say, hey, I want you to come work in my field and do it my way, he could go, uh, no, can't do it. I belong to somebody else. Well, don't go that way. Do this way and serve it this way and go into this life. Go this lifestyle. Just, just live this way and say, no. No, can't do it. Because I plainly said, I love my master, my family, and my children. I will not go out. And I submitted to him. It wasn't forced on him. It was submitted By the way, the marks in his ear was made by his master. The master said, I want you to stay. You want to stay? I'll let you stay. And he marked him. But guess what? The master, our master, the Lord Jesus, who marks us, has his own marks, his own piercings. In John 20, 27, he saith to Thomas, remember doubting Thomas? Thomas missed church first Sunday night after the resurrection. Jesus showed up and he showed his disciples, look at my hands, look at my feet, feel me. He says, see that I'm alive, seal these marks. Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas, when they told him later, said, oh, you missed church Sunday night. Jesus showed up. He said, I don't believe it. And I won't believe it until I can touch those holes in his hands and his feet. And I see those piercings, then I will believe it. The next Sunday night, Jesus showed up. Sunday nights. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand. He said, Feel the holes in my hand, and thrust it into my side. Take your side, where they pierced his side with the sword, making sure he was dead. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So next time I feel a little sorry about my piercing, if you will, I got to remember his piercing for me on the cross of Calvary. Nailed to the cross for your sins and mine. 
His piercings are much worse than my piercing. His was voluntary also. He did it for you and he did it for me. He took all the hell you deserve and all the hell I deserve on the cross of Calvary so we could escape hell and spend eternity with him in heaven. So this morning, if you're not saved, you need to accept his salvation. Look on him who is pierced. John 19, 37. Again, another scripture saith, they look on him whom they pierced. There at the cross, they soldiers look, the ones they pierced, and they looked upon him that it would be fulfilled in the scripture. What scripture? Psalm twenty two sixteen. 16. Hundreds of years before, for good dogs have compassed me. He said, those, these Gentiles have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Except his piercing. He voluntarily got pierced for you and for me. Say, okay, preacher, I am saved. I'm glad. You're free to go. But I guarantee you the master says, I hope you don't. I hope you don't. Can we say, again, this is just simple and key, but I love my master. I can go. I'm not chained here. I can go. I, don't, I can decide to live any life I want to. But I love my master. And I love my family. I want to make a commitment. I want to stay and serve forever. And lest I forget, it's a spiritual mark in my life, spiritual mark in my heart. The all, the ear, and the door. You can walk away and say, that was one of the strangest messages I ever heard. Or you could say, Jesus, I don't want to go away. I love you. And I love the family. And I'm willing to stay. I'm wanting to stay. He says, good, come here. What a difference it'll make when the trials come. Can I go on? Yeah, I think so. Somebody hurt my feelings. I think I'll go away. No, I don't think I can. Because I love my master. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, what an amazing little instruction you gave to the Jews. And it's there for our instruction also. As a picture, as an illustration. Even as in Romans it says we present ourselves a living sacrifice. We give ourselves over to you as your servant forever. Not because we have to, but because we love you. Not because we have to, because we like serving you. Not because we have to, but we love the family. We love people like you love people. Lord, I don't know how the folks are able to receive this this morning, but I know in my life the best I know how, I'm holding out my ear spiritually to you. I've done it in the past. It keeps me going sometimes because I'm not my own. So Father, if there's somebody here that's not saved, not sure they're on their way to heaven, Lord, please help them step out so we can show them from your word how they can know for sure heaven's your home and hell is not their destiny, but heaven is because of what you've done on the cross of Calvary. And for those of us who are saved again, help us make the commitment, help us think, can we go back? Can we find that little spiritual mark or somewhere in our life we said, I will not go out free. I don't want to be free from you, God. I want to be free in you. I'll stay and serve. Lord, whatever the need is, please help us today. And we're careful to thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. As we stand to our feet and while the instruments play. If you need to do business with God, it's right there. If you're not sure you're saved, I ask you to step out. I'll meet you right here. We'll have a man with a man, lady with a lady, take the Word of God and show you from the Bible how to be saved. Won't scare you. Won't do strange things to you. Just reveal the Scriptures, answer any questions, try to help you pray and receive Christ.